about once or twice a year, I'm actually at Shoreline and not preaching. Uh, otherwise, I'm preaching here or preaching somewhere else. And, uh, and this is one of those days where I get to sit and receive. And there are a few people I'd rather sit and receive from their teaching and their preaching than Joshua Ryan Butler. Uh, I, I love his heart. I love his passion for Jesus. Uh, Josh is a local church pastor. Uh, he's an author. As a matter of fact, the, the two books I have right here that he's written, and the third one I heard a lot about the last couple of days. He's passionate about spending some time writing here in Monterey the next couple of days. Pray for him as he does that. But these two books will, will challenge you. They will delight you. They will stretch you. They're, they're, they're brilliantly written, but right from the, the heart of God. And so I encourage you when the service is over, uh, the bookstore, we don't, it's not usually open, but the Connections Cafe is a big bookstore with all of our best books from the whole conference yesterday. And so go there and check those out after the service. But, but Josh is an author. He's a pastor. He's a husband to his wonderful wife, Holly. He's a dad to his three kids. And, and he's here to open the word and to talk with us about the heart of God, the love of God. Because really, justice and righteousness is about the right, just, good heart of God. And when we get captured by that, we want to live the way God has designed people to live. And so as I invite Josh to come and share with you, uh, I, I, when I think about Josh, uh, Joshua Ryan Butler, I think about the fact that he has uh, the, the mind of a scholar and the heart of a pastor and the joy and delight of about a five-year-old kid. <laughs> and so Josh, come and share God's word with us. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Well, good morning. Oh, man, I love Shoreline. It's so good to be back with you. Uh, this week, we had Kevin in Portland, and it was awesome. Uh, he was presenting to about 250 pastors and ministry leaders uh, gathered in town and sharing from Organic Outreach and, uh, and alongside with Luis Palau there. And it was powerful. I just want to let you know that the work that God's doing in and through you here in Monterey and this area is impacting even beyond uh, up in my hometown. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 98 today. So if you have your Bible with you and you want to turn there, that would be great. God is a God of life. He is not only our creator, but our sustainer. We not only come from him, but are held together in him. I'd love for each of you at this moment to take a deep breath. Breathe in and out. That breath that you just breathed is a gift from God. The breath in our lungs is a gift. In Hebrew, actually, the word for uh, breath and spirit, it's the same word, ruach. And the picture and imagery is one that God has breathed his breath. He has given us his spirit. He has actually given us life. And our life is held together and sustained in him. So God is a God of life. God values all life, but God particularly values the lives of those who are vulnerable, those who might be mistreated or exploited or abused and harmed. And so we want to look at this morning at God's heart for particularly vulnerable lives. This gives rise to his love of justice and his desire for justice in the world. And so we want to look at this with the focus of kind of vulnerable children. We're in a series called Justice for All, and this is the second week of that series. And today we want to look at how this value of life, God's value of life, gives rise to his heartbeat of justice for vulnerable children. So if you would read with me in Psalm 98, one through six. May God arise. Oh, 68, I'm sorry. My eyes are bad. <laughs> Psalm 68. May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God. All right, so God seems angry. Why is God so angry? Like did someone steal his breakfast bagel? Did someone lose the remote control? <laughs> no, uh, it's gonna tell us as we read on. It says, but may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. So why are the righteous glad? Like God's come and he seems kind of angry about it, and yet the righteous are glad. And that word righteous, we can tend to think of that today as like self-righteous, right? We kind of associate it with that. But in Hebrew, actually, the word righteous and just are the same synonymous words. And so the picture is those who love justice, those who care about justice and righteousness and the, the wholeness and integrity of God's world, they're glad as God comes and arises. And it's about to tell us why. So sing to God, sing in praise of his name. 
Extol him who rides in the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. But the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. So we see here God arising and the just, the righteous are happy and uh, God comes but he's a bit angry and the reason he's angry is because there are lives who are being mistreated. And so we see here that God himself becomes a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. And that language is threaded throughout the Old Testament. It's common language, what's often been called like the quartet of the vulnerable. These four categories of the widow and the orphan and the foreigner and the poor. And God's heart, while he values all life, he particularly values these lives because these were the most vulnerable members of that society. And so God arises with concern for those lives that are vulnerable and are being mistreated. We see here that God loves justice because God loves people. God's love for the world gives rise to his justice for the world. Sometimes we get that mixed up. We tend to think maybe like uh, sometimes God's loving, he cares about us, and sometimes God's about justice, like dealing with stuff. And, and we can tend to split those apart, but in the Bible, they're actually integrally connected. It is because God loves people, this love for people gives rise to his justice for the world, to seeing that people are treated properly as objects of his affection. God loves people. We see here that God is a father who loves vulnerable children. I love this phrase that God is a father to the fatherless. He arises as their defender. And this was Israel's story. The psalm goes on and in the following verses. It recounts how God did this for Israel when he set them free out of Egypt. And Israel is going, man, we were that orphaned child. We were that fatherless people who were being oppressed and vulnerably exploited and abused in Egypt. And God, you became a father to us in our fatherlessness. God, we are those captives that you set free, that you delivered and called and adopted as your own. And this is our story as the church, as the people of God. We are a people who have been adopted into the family of God. God has brought us to himself. He has set us as captives free. This is our story. So I wanna ask this morning, how can we be pictures of this God to our world? Because we see here that parents can be a a powerful picture, right? Uh, Have you seen uh, the show? Maybe uh, uh, raise your hand if you've seen, have you seen the show This Is Us? Anyone in the... (laughs) I love that show. I, you know, I've watched it this last year or so, and end of every episode, I'm crying, and the tears are streaming down, and I'm trying to hide it from my wife and kids. And, oh, yeah, good job, Jack. Good job. You know, and <laughs> this show has won all these awards, and it's kind of blowing up, and popularity-wise, and all. And what is it about this show that draws us in? And I've got a hunch. Let me tell you my my thesis: is this is one of the first shows that I've seen in a while where there's a strong image of a good good father, one who lays down his life for his family, who loves and lifts up his spouse, who sacrificially gives of himself for his children. And I think we're drawn to that kind of an image of a father because that's the father that we have in heaven. That is an accurate reflection, depiction, a window into the very heartbeat of God. And so one of the first places, uh, if you're a parent in the room, I think one of the first places that we can try and picture and image this God is, is, is in the intimacy. It starts at home and how we treat our families, how we treat one another. Because we see that if you've had a good parent, you know, good parents can be a window into the heart of God. But you also know when that gets broken, bad parent can, can damage one's understanding of God or image. It can be a painful and hurtful experience. But the good news this morning is if, if you've been abused or abandoned or neglected or traumatized. I've got good news that the gospel is about a redemptive father who invites us in and can redeem our stories and bring us into the wholeness and health that he has. God is a father to the fatherless. So there's three areas, though, that I wanna look at. How can we be, as church, as a picture of God to areas where that's been broken, that image has been broken in our world, 
in our society. And the first place is I believe adoption is a picture of God. Adoption can be a picture of this God who is a father to the fatherless. And at verse six, it says, God sets the lonely in families. I love that image. God is a God who sets the lonely in families. And he does that through us, through his people. God takes those who are lonely and has called us to be a redemptive family that he can bring people into and they find a place of belonging and care and security and hope. And right now in our nation, we have a foster care crisis. There are over 400,000 children in foster care as we speak. As we saw there last year, over 600,000 Children spent time at one point or another in the foster care system. In our own city, in my own city back home, in our churches, we have been uh, blessed to be part of this movement of attempting to engage this crisis. We've had a ministry at our church called Welcome Home, and, and it's been part of the citywide thing where it's been awesome to see uh, all across the church, so children making welcome boxes, like care packages for children who are just entering foster care uh, with some gifts and toys and games and a loving handwritten note, letting them know you are seen, you are known, you are loved. It's looked like extreme makeovers, going to the child welfare offices that are often beat up and run down and going, man, we just wanna lavish this place. There's now been 12 extreme makeovers on every child welfare office in the Portland metro area, bringing fresh paint and new furniture and toys that aren't broken and uh, like new books and, and just uh, over $250,000 worth of resources donated by churches on top of all the volunteer labor in caring for these vulnerable places. Moving up to a little more intensity and commitment, it's looked like Foster Parents Night Out, where at nine different churches around the city, every month over 500 of our city's most vulnerable children come to the church and it's a place where we just throw a massive party for them, where they get to come and there's like Olympic athletes and Portland trailblazers and clowns and people juggling and on unicycles or all the you know, circus stuff. But we, just, we wanna throw the biggest bash with food and fun and games for a few hours to love on our city's most vulnerable children and to give the families who are caring for them a night out on the town to rest and get a break um, and to let them know that they're loved by Jesus. We're doing this because we love Jesus. And out of that, uh, there have been over 160 families that have stepped forward and stepped into embracing our city's most vulnerable children. In our own church, it's been amazing to see 35 new families step forward and step into that together and support one another because it can be isolating and hard on your own. So having a community of support. How, I wanna ask though, how can adoption be a picture of God? In what way is adoption a picture of God? When I think of that, I think of Jim and Sarah. And so Jim and Sarah uh, stepped into foster care and they received Misha into their home. And Misha was a teenager. Uh, she had been uh, trafficked into the sex trade and so was coming out of just some really gnarly, hard, abusive experiences, an environment for a young teenager. And as she came into Jim and Misha's home, the first uh, you know, a week or two was just phenomenal. It was kind of the honeymoon phase of like, oh, we love you and we're for you. And Misha's like, oh, I'm so glad to be here. This is great. And it was, a, you know, everyone just loved it and things were going great. And then about week three, uh, the ball dropped, right? And suddenly the behaviors started coming out because when children have experienced trauma or neglect or abuse, uh, it impacts you, it's, it, it's hard and it tends to lead to just some really hard and gnarly behavior. So uh, Misha would throw these fits and tantrums and she would call Sarah every name in the book and mom was not one of them, right? But Jim, she would cozy up to and call dad and be very nice and affectionate and sweet towards him because she learned that's how you get attention and protection and provision from men. And Jim and Sarah, they didn't, they didn't buy into it. You know, they, they didn't play into that. And yet it was still hard on the marriage. It's like they had let the impact of uh, the, the chaos that she'd experienced, it, they were experiencing it now. It, it was a part of their home life. And so as they felt that tension, after about six months, they said, you know, we need, we need to get it out on the town. Let's get a night, date night, dress up to the nines, go out to a fancy restaurant, like just be together and care for our, our marriage. So they got childcare and they went out and they just had a blast and they came home feeling rested and refreshed and they're like, oh, that was so good. We really needed that night out. It's so great, I feel ready to go again. And they got home and they came through the front door 
and the child care worker was like, man, Misha was great. She's upstairs sleeping. Everything went fine. And so they go upstairs and, uh, to get ready for bed. And Jim walks into the bathroom. And Sarah hears him say, oh, no, Sarah, don't come in here. And Sarah, with her curiosity peaked, begins to make for the bathroom. And as Jim is trying to shut the door, Sarah is barging her way through. And she kind of forces her way in and comes inside and steps in to find that Misha has taken her red lipstick and has written all over the bathroom walls and all over the bathroom mirror, and pardon my French, but F you, mom, F you, mom, F you, mom. And Jim, understandably, just goes, oh no. Like, we shouldn't have gone out. This was a mistake. This is gonna destroy Sarah. Why the heck, what were we thinking? We, we should have never gotten into this in the first place. This is just God. What, what are we doing? I, I, I just don't know. I wish I could have cleaned up the bathroom before Sarah got in to see this. And um, to his surprise, though, he turns and he finds that Sarah is laughing. And not like a small laugh, but it kind of starts as a chuckle and begins to build until it, uh, before she knows it, she's crying. And Sarah says she fell, fell over on the floor and was just crying, laughing hysterically. And Jim's like, oh my gosh, this really did break her. Like she's, <laughs> she's gone crazy. Like this is just for my wife. Like what were we doing? And finally he works up the courage to ask like, Sarah, what is so funny? And Sarah, through her laughter and her tears, manages to squeak out, she called me mom. <laughs> she called me mom. It was the first time that Misha had called her mom. And I love how God loves our angry prayers, right? See, I think you and I, we're often like Jim. With God, there are these areas where we feel like, um, man, God, there, there's all this junk kind of scrawled on the bathroom walls, a mirror of my heart, and, but I can't let you see that, God, because you're not gonna be able to take it. And so before you get in, I gotta keep the door shut and kind of get some 409 and some sponges and scrub down the walls and get everything cleaned up. Um, but the reality is, you and I are like Misha. Like we have been beat up and wounded and traumatized by life. We've got junk going on inside of us. And the beauty of the gospel, though, is that God is like Sarah. But God delights. He's big enough to take anything we've got to bring, and he delights to enter into the fullness of our story. And at the end of the day, I think God curls over in that hump of laughter and tears, and he's simply delighted that we would call him dad. Adoption can be a picture of the gospel. When you think about adoption, God, God ad adopts us his own. He declares that we are his, and that, declare, that declaration is secure, and then there's this process of sanctification of being made more like Christ, because with Misha, if 10 years down the road, she's still saying, F you, mom, like there's probably a problem, right? But over time, as you enter into this intimacy and vulnerability and safety of a family, there's, there's a maturity and a health that grows over time. And similarly, it's a picture of the gospel. We are, there's a security being brought into God's family. And then over time, God's love begins to shape and form us as his own. So we have adoption can be a picture of a God who sets the lonely in families and is a father to the fatherless. All right, well, second way that we as the church can picture, be an image of this God, is through uh, engaging, fighting human trafficking, that redeeming those who've been trafficked and enslaved in our world is a way that we can participate in the heartbeat of God, the justice of God. Because we read here in verse five that God is a God who leads out the prisoners with singing. This is who God is and what he does. He sets captives free. There are more slaves in the world today than any time in history. Estimated, uh, International Labor Organization estimates over 20 million people have been trafficked, often into forced labor or the sex trade or commercial exploitation. And this is often uh, women and children who are trafficked. And the reality of the gospel is that we serve a God who frees the slaves. 
We serve a God, as the psalm says, who leads out the prisoners with singing. And this is central to the biblical story, that God is the God of Exodus. In the Old Testament, the foundational story in Israel's history is that God bypassed kind of the mighty superpowers of the ancient world, and he set his name on a nation of slaves, the last and the least, and this vulnerable child who was getting her tail kicked in the world. And God redeems her and calls Israel out of slavery and brings Israel to himself. And we see this in Jesus who launches his ministry in Luke 4 and he gives his mission statement. He quotes from Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news. And he goes on to say, uh, to set the captives free, to bring sight to the blind and uh, justice for the poor and to set the captives free. Our God is a God who sets captives free. This is... Jesus' like tagline, his brand, his motto, his PR campaign. You think about Nike, Nike's brand is just do it, right? McDonald's is, I'm loving it. Uh, Skittles is what tastes the rainbow, right? Jesus' tagline is setting captives free. Setting captives free since 33 AD. Jesus is coming after this, right? <laughs> <laughs> How do we do this? How do we participate in this picture of God? Well, there's three main ways that, uh, to combat trafficking. One, the first is intervention. And this is what we typically think of. This is like police officers uh, breaking down the door and coming in and pulling kids out uh, of a gnarly, dangerous situation. Internationally, International Justice Mission is a great organization that's doing this kind of law enforcement uh, support and justice work in the world as a whole. Uh, so that's, a, that's one phenomenal thing, the, the kind of work that we can support our local law enforcement and international organizations who are doing that kind of work. Um, a second uh, avenue is, is, is restoration, right? So if interve- intervention is getting the captives out, restoration is helping restore them afterwards. And so this is often like counselors and people who help people deal with the trauma and the abuse that they've experienced and reintegrate into society. And so uh, at our church, we've partnered with uh, the sexual assault resource in our city, and they, they're housed at our church offices, and some of our people have become trained as counselors to help walk with people who are coming out of captivity. Uh, we've partnered with law enforcement on the intervention side and found some creative ways to just go, what are you doing and how can we support? How can we support the work that you're doing to set captives free? Uh, but for a lot of us, you know, if you're not a police officer or you're not a counselor, you're kind of going, what about, man, is there anything I can do? My heart's broken for this. Is there any way I can help? And I think one of the strongest ways for us, many of us, that's often overlooked is on the preventative side, right? Like if intervention is getting captives out and restoration is helping them recover, prevention is trying to create a buffer around people so they don't get brought into captivity in the first place. And it shocked me to learn, you know, I believe once again that foster care and adoption is a phenomenal way we can do this. It shocked me to learn that in our city uh, that roughly 95% of the children who are trafficked into uh, the sex trade are in foster care. 95%. 95%. And it makes sense. Do you think about they're often in a vulnerable situation? They've been abused. They've been traumatized. They might not have the support networks or systems to help them. And so as one expert was telling me, if you're a trafficker here in the States, one of the things that you'll do is you might go down to the local mall, right? And you'll walk through the mall and uh, they'll have younger guys. And as, as, a, as a girl passes by, he'll say, hey, you're beautiful, right? And if the girl looks at him and kind of smiles, oh, thanks, you know, uh, he'll just keep walking. But if he walks by a girl and he says, you're beautiful, and she kind of puts her head down in shame, if she doesn't believe that, like he knows that's his mark, right? There is a preying on those who have been exploited, those who are vulnerable, those who are in gnarly situations. And so, once again, one of the ways that we can be a picture of God's value of life, his heartbeat of justice, his care for vulnerable children is on the preventative end of wrapping around kids in our community who are vulnerable. On the international end, that could look like child sponsorship uh, that Kevin talked about earlier. Like That's just one simple way and thing that you can do to actually help support and put a buffer around a child who otherwise might be vulnerable, extremely vulnerable to getting trafficked. 
All right, well, we've seen that, uh, you know, two ways. One is um, adoption and foster care. We've seen that another is uh, engaging human trafficking. Uh, and the third here I wanna look at is that caring for the unborn can be a picture of God's heart for vulnerable children. Caring for the unborn. And I know that this can be a loaded, uh, hot potato, de- political, you know, kind of politically divisive topic. Um, and sometimes I think our language for this is not helpful. And so uh, often, you know, you'll get asked in, in our culture, well, are you, are you pro-life or are you pro-choice? And often what that means, pro-life is like you're for the baby and uh, pro-choice is that you're for the, the mother, right? And so the implicit is kind of like, hey, are you for the, the baby or are you for the mom? And so what I often like to say is, hey, I'm pro-grace, right? Like I'm for both. I'm for the child and for the mother. And yes, we live in a democracy, and so there's uh, the, the ability that we've been given to vote and to try and vote for policies and practices and things that will, will help safeguard life. But there's also this piece where I believe Jesus is calling us as the body of Christ, as the church, to embrace mothers in a vulnerable position. And I'd be naive to think that there, there are not people here in this room that maybe you've endured Uh, the difficulty and the trauma of a hard decision like that. And I want you to know this morning that we, Shoreline and the church is a church, it's a place of grace, that Jesus is not here to beat you up over your past, but to fight for your future. That, That he did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. He is not here to imprison you in shame or guilt, but to set you free for himself. We are pro grace. And within that, though, we find that the womb today is one of the most vulnerable places to live. Right? The womb is a vulnerable place. You may have seen the news this year that in Iceland, uh, there are claims to have almost errat- have eradicated Down syndrome because there are now tests to find out if a child has it, and if so, uh, to be aborted. Okay? That has become a growing conversation in our own culture. The New York Times and Chicago Tribune, is that ethical now, 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 that, now that those tests are there? And I think there's a significance here to the power of language. You know, even the language that we use, the language of a fetus uh, can be something, that we, we tend to think of that more like an it. It can be dehumanizing versus the reality of a person, an unborn child that God is forming in the womb. It's glory. And once more, similar to how we've seen foster care and adoption, can, I believe adoption can impact uh, human trafficking. I also believe adoption can impact abortion, right? Like I was struck by uh, hearing Mother Teresa's speech that she gave at the National Prayer Breakfast years ago. It was under the Clinton administration, so Bill Clinton is there, and Republican and Democratic leaders from across the aisle, from all over the map, are gathered there, and uh, Mother Teresa, as an elderly nun, kind of crunched over the podium, and she spoke with this voice of power, and she said this. She said, we are fighting, she's talking about back home in Calcutta in India, She said, we are fighting abortion by adoption, by care of the mother and adoption for her baby. Please don't kill the child. I want the child. Please give me the child. We have saved over 3,000 children from abortion. These children have brought such love and joy to their adopting parents and have grown up so full of love and joy. I love this quote. I think it embodies... God's heartbeat for us as the church, as the body of Christ, that we would embrace both the mother and the child, that we would uh, actually, it, it may not be for every individual, like adoption is something that only some of us are gonna be called to. It can be like joining the Navy SEALs, right? Like it's, it, it's a high calling. And yet we could be a church that values and supports those who are on the front lines and that we would be able to embrace and together find ways to support and embrace vulnerable children in our community. When we do this, I believe we embody the heartbeat of God that values all life and that is for justice for the vulnerable. We embody the heart of God who in Isaiah 49, verse 15 and 16, God says that even if a mother could forget her child, I will not forget you. I have carved you on the palm of my hand. Well, as we kind of wrap up here, I wanna wrap up by kind of landing on it. How, how can we participate then and being pictures of this God, a God who is a father to the fatherless. How do we as the church do this? Because I believe God has called us as the church to be a redemptive family. If God is a father to the fatherless, we are called to be a family for the familyless, a place of belonging, 
where those who are hurting and shattered and broken can come and find rest and find peace and find care, support, can find family. And that can be a redemptive story because the same way that sin can spiral us out downward, uh, it can be kind of a downward spiral, redemption can be an upward spiral. Right? Like redemption can actually transform not only us today but future generations. I was struck by this a few months ago with my own son, Torin. Uh, we stepped into foster care um, as part of this movement years ago and we received Torin as a newborn from the hospital. Today now he's four years old and we've been able to adopt him. And, uh, and it's interesting, Torin is awesome. And he loves, but I also think it was like, I call him the Torinado, right? Because he, <laughs> he loves to get his hands in everything and throw things around. And, and he always wants to help in the kitchen. So I'll be doing, he wants to help me do the dishes and he wants to help me make breakfast and all. Um, the issue is he breaks things. <laughs> He's not very good at it, right? So there's shattered dishes and there's you know, eggs broken and splattered all over the counter. And so I'm like, Torn, that's okay, buddy, thank you. But it, I'm thinking it's just kind of easier if I do it. So my wife and I are always kind of steering him to the living room and kind of like, hey, go, go play with your Legos. Go, here's, here's your toys, like do that. And we got this, you know? And a few months ago, I was driving into work and I heard Jesus speak to me. I felt the spirit of God communicate to me. What I heard God say was, Torn believes his identity is inconvenience. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. That in ways that run deeper than he knows, his story has labeled him an inconvenience. For his mom, uh, we love his mom, we've built a relationship with his mom, uh, but she struggled with drug addiction and with being in and out of prison. And so his mom, though, like he spent the first nine months in the womb addicted to meth. And for his mom, the implicit message it's like, you're an inconvenience because I value the drugs more. For his father in prison, uh, who we believe his father to be, refused the paternity test because he said, it's an inconvenience. I don't even want to know if he's mine. His story in deeper ways than he knows has labeled him an inconvenience. And now in this subtle, small way, uh, my wife and I were convicted that we've been kind of telling him, hey, you, you helping with the dishes, you helping with the breakfast, that's an inconvenience, go, go over here. And the conviction, what I heard God say was, Torin believes his identity is inconvenience, but that's not his true identity. His true identity is helper. So I went to Target, bought a whole bunch of dishes, I'm like, you can break them all now, man, I got 50 dishes, you can break them all, you can like shatter the eggs all over the counter, you can make a mess and we don't care because I am a father who loves you and I wanna embrace you as not only a vulnerable child but one who is now a part of our family. And this is our story, this is you and I's story. We are vulnerable children who have been adopted and embraced within the family of God and God's love and his security and his outpouring of who he is, it charts a new course, a new trajectory, a new destiny for you and for I. He wants to redeem and shape our identities for his kingdom and for his glory. So as we close today, just the practical question, what can I do? And I just feel like one, one thing I wanna kinda, practical thing I wanna say is, man, if you, uh, if, if you struggle right now with pornography or addicted to that, um, all the stuff we've been talking about, it, it's connected at the root. It's a multi-billion dollar industry that fuels human trafficking. When I talk to friends who are experts in the industry, they go, man, People don't know this, but pornography is fueling this beast in our world. The exploitation of women. And so I believe a first step might be stop feeding the monster. Right? Both the monster within your heart and the monster it's unleashed in God's world. That we would move towards valuing, treating with dignity, particularly women and children and the vulnerable, that we would become a people that values all life as God values all life and particularly the vulnerable. That our conviction would grow that God loves justice because God loves people. That God's love for the world gives rise to his justice for the world. Our God is a God of life, and he calls us to value all life, and particularly the lives of the vulnerable. Would you join me in prayer? Jesus, we thank you, God, that you 
value vulnerable children, God, so much so that Jesus, you became a vulnerable child. That you in your incarnation, you entered Mary's womb and you became vulnerable and dependent and received life from the very creation that you created. And God, you entered with us in our vulnerability, even in our exploitation and our shame and all that, God, as you went to the cross, you became vulnerable and endured as the Son of God, the greatness of our injustice, our iniquity, our sin, God. And thank you that you did it, God, to restore us and to make us whole, to give us a new identity and a new name. Jesus, we thank you that you not only became a vulnerable child, but you welcome vulnerable children. God, that you are a God who values all life. You are sustaining all life. And and God, that you are welcoming those who have been mistreated. Even this morning in this room, you welcome us as vulnerable children, God. To enter your home, your household as our heavenly father, to find safety and comfort and security, to find provision and protection, to find your care, God, to find a place of belonging with you and amongst your people. Lord, I pray that we as the church could become a redemptive family. You are a father to the fatherless, that we would become a family for the familyless, a place of belonging for those who are hurting, who are shattered, who are broken. And God, as we do that, we would experience your life together. Jesus, we love you, and we pray all these things in your glorious name, under your authority, and for your glory. Amen.